today to continue the reading. Let's see where we're at. Dwemer History, Volumes 3 and 4. Ah, okay. Let's go with Brief History of the Empire, Volume 3. By Stronar the III, Imperial Historian. The first volume of this series told, in brief, the story of the succession of the first eight emperors of the Septum dynasty from Tiber I to Kintida II. The second volume described the War of the Red Diamond and the six emperors that followed its aftermath. From Uriel III to Cassinder I. At the end of that volume, it was described how the Emperor Cassindir's half-brother Uriel IV assumed the throne of the Empire of Tamriel. It will be recalled that Uriel IV was not a septum by birth. His mother, though she reigned as empress for many years, was a dark elf married to a true septum emperor, Pelagius III. Uriel's father was actually Kataria, the first consort. After Pelagius' death, a Breton nobleman named Galivier Lariat, before taking the throne of the empire, Cassander I had ruled the kingdom of Wayrest, but poor health had forced him to retire. Cassander had no children, so he legally adopted his half brother, Uriel, and abdicated the kingdom. Seven years later, Cassinda inherited the empire at the death of his mother. Three years after that, Uriel once again found himself the recipient of Cassinda's inheritance. Interesting. He feels half dark elf with skin dark. Interesting. We have Bretons who are already a mixed group between Imperials and High Elves. We have a Breton and a dark elf. Where they're so are they like more magical than regular brands? Interesting. We can't play such mixed races. It'd be cool if it could. Or at least mix them up like an alchemy potion. In the creation, for so Elder School 6, in the creation, uh, part of the game. Character creation menu. Uriel the Fort's reign was a long and difficult one. Despite being a legally adopted member of the Septum family, and despite the Lariat family's high position, indeed they were distant cousins of the Septums, few of the Elder Council could be persuaded to accept him fully as a blood descendant of Tiber. The Council had assumed much responsibility during Kataria the First's long reign and Cassandir's first, well, the first set short one and a strong-willed alien monarch like Uriel IV found it impossible to command their unproven fealty. Time and again, the council and emperor were at odds, and time and again, the council won the battles. <laughs> Since the days of Pelagius II, the elder council had consisted of the wealthiest men and women in the empire, and the power they wielded was conclusive. The council's last victory over Uriel IV was posthumous, and Durak, Uriel the Fort's son, was disinherited by a vote of council, and a cousin more closely related to the original Septum line was proclaimed Sephiris II in the Third Era. 247, man, this is like a freaking European freaking dynastic battle up in here. All cousins and brothers and halflings and shit, damn. For the first nine years of Sephiris II's reign, both royal to and Durak battled the Imperial forces. In an act that the sage Pedantine called Tiber Septum's heart beating, no more the council granted Endorak the High Rock Kingdom of Shornhelm to end the war. And Endorak's descendants still rule there. By and large, Severus II had foes that demanded more of his attention than Endorak. Out of a Cimmerian nightmare, in the words of Edentine, a man who called himself the Camoran Usurper led an army of Daedra and undead warriors on a rampage through Villainwood, 
conquering kingdom after kingdom. Few could resist his onslaughts, and as month turned to bloody month in the year Third Era 249, and fewer try. A couple years after. Two years. Zephyrus II sent more and more mercenaries into Hammerfell to stop the usurper's northward march, but they were bribed or slaughtered and raised as undead. The story of the Cameron usurper deserves a book of its own. Recommended the reader find Palox Iltris, The Fall of the Usurper, for more detail. In short, however, the destruction of the forces of the usurper had little to do with the efforts of the Emperor. <laughs> And although the great regional victory and an increase in hostility towards the seemingly efficacious, efficacious empire, Euro the fourth, not a Uriels, Zephyrus the second son and successor, swiveled opinion back toward the late power of the empire. Turning the attention of Tamriel away from internal strife, Uriels embarked on a series of invasions. Began almost the moment he took the throne in the third era, 268. Leo V conquered Oroskria in 270. Ooh, Roskria. Interesting. They're doing Beyond Skyrim is being a modern Roskria. <laughs> so he's the one. Does he also is he also the one Leo V who conquered? Who tried to conquer the other continent, Ath Morgan? I forgot what the name was. Let's look it up again. So he has conquered Roskri in 271. So 21 years. 247, 268. Yeah, but 21 years later, Sun took the throne. About three years later, he's conquered Roskria. Katanoki in 276, five years later. Three years later, Neslea and S. Roniet in 284. 16 years. In the third era 288, he embarked on his most ambitious enterprise, the invasion of the continent kingdom of Akavir. Oh, they considered a continent kingdom. It's probably the biggest kingdom in on Mundus, because the other kingdoms are small, other than the empire. The various High Rock kingdoms, even it's called High Rock, are small. They each own a portion of land. Same thing with, the, I'm assuming, the Villainwood Kingdoms. <laughs> Is Akavir bigger than Tamriel? This ultimately proved a failure. For, four, for two years later, Hero the Fifth was killed in Akavir on the battlefield of Alonit. Oh shit, he died in Akavir. Found content from Tamriel away from the capital city. Snake Men. Nevertheless, Yulifit holds a reputation second only to Tiber, one of the two great warrior emperors of Tamriel. The last four emperors, beginning with Yulifit's infant son, are described in the fourth and final volume of this series. Interesting. Let's finish this series up. The Brief History of the Empire, Part 4, by Strona Katoj, the third imperial historian. The first book of this series described. The year old, the sixth, was but five years old. In fact, the year old, the sixth, was born only shortly before his father left for Akavir. The year old, the fifth's only other progeny by a Morgan. Morganetic Alliance were the twins Mori Hata and Eloisha, who had been born a month after Yuriel V left. Yuriel V was crowned in the 290th year of the Third Era. The Imperial Consort Tonika, as the boy's mother, was given a restricted regency until Yuriel VI reached his maturity. The Elder Council retained the real power as they had ever since the days of Kataria I. The council so enjoyed its unlimited and unrestricted freedom to promul promulgate laws and generate profits that Yuriel VI was not given full license to rule until 307, when he was already 22 years old. He had been slowly assuming positions of responsibility for years, but both the council and his mother, who enjoyed even her limited regency, 
willow to hand over the reins. Dang, even his own mom. By the time he came to the throne, the mechanisms of government gave him little power, except for that of the imperial veto. This power, however, almost sounds a little bit like the Jap Japanese situation. This power, however, he regularly and vigorously exercised. By 313, Uriel VI could boast with conviction that he truly did rule Tamriel. He utilized defunct spy networks and guard units to bully and coerce the difficult members of the Elder Council. His half-sister Morihata was, not surprisingly, his staunchest ally, especially after her marriage to Baron, whose fake bursting of Winterhold brought her considerable wealth and influence. As the sage Ugarij said, Uriel V conquered Esseroniet, but Uriel VI conquered the Elder Council. When Uriel VI fell off a horse and could not be resuscitated by the finest imperial healers, his beloved sister Morihata took up the imperial tiara. At 25 years of age, she had been described by admittedly self-serving diplomats as the most beautiful creature in all of Tamriel. She was certainly well learned, vivacious, athletic, and a well-practiced politician. She brought the arch magister of Skyrim to the imperial city and created the second imperial battle mage since the days of Tiber Septum. Morihata finished the job her brother had begun and made the imperial province a true government under the empress and later the emperor. Outside the imperial province, however, the empire had been slowly disintegrating. Open revolutions and civil wars had raged unchallenged since the days of her grandfather Sephiroth II. Carefully coordinating her counterattacks, Morihata slowly claimed back her rebellious vassals always avoiding or extending herself. Don Morihata's military campaigns were remarkably successful. Her deliberate pace often frustrated the council. One councilman, an Argonian who took the Colovian name of Thorelicus Horonis, furious at her refusal to send troops at his troubled Black Marsh, commonly believed to have hired the assassin who claimed her life in Third Era 339. Ramus was summarily tried and executed, though he protested his innocence to the last. Morihata had no surviving children. Eloja had died of fear four years before. Eloja's 25-year-old son, Pelagius, left crowned Pelagius IV. Pelagius IV continued his aunt's work, slowly bringing back under his wing the radical and refractory kingdoms, duchies, and baronies of the empire. He exercised Morihata's poor, circumspect pace in his endeavor, but alas, he did not attain her success. The kingdoms had been free of constraint for so long that even a benign imperial presence was considered odious. Nevertheless, when Pelagius died after a notably stable and prosperous 29-year reign, Tamriel was closer to unity than it had been since the days of Uriel I. Our current emperor, his awesome and terrible majesty, Uriel Septum VII, son of Pelagius IV. Has the diligence of his great aunt Morihita, the political skill of his great uncle Uriel VI, and the military prowess of his great Grand Uncle Uriel V. For 21 years he reigned and brought justice in order to Tamriel. In the year Third Era, 389, however, his Imperial Battle Mage, Jaeger Tharn, betrayed him. Uriel VIII VII was imprisoned in a dimension of Tharn's creation, and Tharn used his sorcery of illusion to assume the Emperor's aspect. For the next 10 years, Tharn abused imperial privilege but did not continue Uriel VII's schedule of reconquest. It is not yet entirely known what Tharn's goals and personal accomplishments were during the 10 years he masqueraded as a liege lord. In the Third Era 399, an enigmatic champion defeated the battle mage in the dungeons of the imperial palace and freed Uriel VII from his other dimensional jail. Since his emancipation, Uriel Septim VII has worked diligently to renew the battles that would reunite Tamriel. Tharn's interference broke the momentum, it is true, but the years since 
then have proven that there is hope of the golden age of type receptions ruling Colossine Cambria once again. Oh, that's it. Yeah, so this again this ends at this period, so old history book. Perfecto. That scholarly look, thinking look, like Socrates up in here. Not just a warrior with muscles, but an uh, intellect. We'll read Frontier Conquest, Ice Rates. Okay, let's go with Ice Rates. Urbane's bestiary, 17th of last seed. Winter's chill descended upon me as I traveled further north through the frozen plains and mountains. I settled at an inn at Dawnstar for a moment of respite and a warm meal. Another traveler there told me to be cautious that there are creatures who settle into the powder white of the snow with nary a clue to the careless until it is too late. We went on and on with wild gestures and fantastic tales of entire merchant expeditions being killed by the beasts. Change around. The stories frightened the other inn patrons. But I will not be turned by a coward's tale. I will see these from my own eyes, from those icy caves and snow capped peaks of the north are exactly the type of places that I call that call to an, an adventurer like me. It did not take me long to find what I thought. These ice wraiths are lucid. Serpentine creatures of magic, as if conquered, jured from the frozen tundra. 
and glaciers of Skyrim itself, at one with an environment that makes them nearly invisible, these thorough apparitions are the death of many Nords. If not by their sudden unholy strike that cast entire body through their target, then by the malady of wit pain, a curse of infection that dulls the intellect and makes the target even more the victim. As deadly as they are, ice wraiths are simple minded in their determination, and combat is a straightforward affair, and brute force, and a sharp blade are enough to fell these savage creatures. Only the hardiest of men would hope to survive just one of these feasts, but I have slain two with gentle beings. It's good that I found I can make decent coins selling the ice wraiths teeth as they are prized and greedy and an alchemical potion. It's interesting. And it will continue to afford me the opportunity to search these lands for a challenge. Worthy of story, for I have yet to see what would make me tremble. Interesting. Her bane. What and here, but this is where my bookshelves. Eat this. One, two, three, four. That's what we'll do next time. I've got your back. Sit. Let's see. Thank you.